We got a lot to go through in not a lot of time, so let's get started. Um, so this is just kind of a best practices for running jobs within uh, NERSC. The first kind of thing to remember is that they charge differently between CPU and GPU. And so you want to make sure to set your account accordingly. So your account is your group number that's in Iris for whatever project you're working on. And you can set the A option for your account for the CPU, or you can use the underscore G on your account for GPU. Um, as far as constraints go for the jobs, you would use C for CPU only nodes and C GPU for GPU only nodes. And there are two modules that you're gonna to wanna to be aware of as well. Uh, the GPU module is loaded by default. And so if you're gonna use GPU building or nodes, you're gonna to wanna to use that because it loads a CUDA aware MPI. And if you're not going to use any GPU stuff, you just wanna use the CPU load module. And again, like I said, it's, it's important to specify your account because if you belong to multiple groups or multiple projects, you wanna make sure that you're appropriately using your hours against the correct allocation. The default that's set in Iris is not always the default one that you want. So make sure to set your account when you're using your batch scripts or your S runs. Um, there's gonna be a lot of talk about IO coming up later. So I'm not gonna to go too far into that, but try not to run your production jobs in your home directory. Um, it's not meant for that. It's meant for longer term, small storage. Try and run in Scratch. It's large temporary storage and optimized for read and write. It's a luster file system. And it's temporary storage because occasionally they will um, clean it up. So if you leave files in there for a couple of months that haven't been touched, uh, it'll be removed. So you just want to stage your data there. Um, and in general, if it's possible, you should install your software to Global Common Software. It's optimized for reads and it's mounted read only to the compute nodes. And that's done via a DVS option that again, they'll talk about more later but it's better here um, for performance if you install your software under Global Common Software um, associated with your group. Uh, due to the backfill scheduling that SLRM is using at NERSC, um, if you use a short or a variable length job, you can get a better result if you set the time limits in your batch script. So this is kind of a way to show the minimum and the upper bound. And another thing is if for some reason maintenance is happening on the file systems and you don't want your job to run unless the file systems are there because it could use up your allocation, make sure to set the licenses for uh, different options. Um, this is just for Scratch and CFS, but there's a bunch of licenses for other stuff. And those are all in the documentation. Um, one of the more complex things about running jobs on Perlmutter with Slurm is the logical cores per task. And this is something that comes up a lot. Um, even I have trouble with this at times. Um, each CPU core has two hardware threads. One is physical, one is logical. And so that's why it's important to specify these logical cores per task. Otherwise you could be using up um, you could be oversubscribing your node and using up more memory and more resources than you really should be and want to. So the important thing to remember with the affinity here is that a CPU only node has a total of 128 physical or 256 logical CPU cores. And it's 128 because there's, it has a CPU only node has two CPUs attached to it, two AMD epics. A GPU node has a GPU and a physical CPU node, or a physical CPU, excuse me. Um, and again, there's more, lots more information on processes and thread affinity here um, on the documentation. So when you're specifying the logical cores per task, you wanna set the dash C option. And the only time you're not gonna wanna set this is if you're doing one task um, per node. And that's typically not, there's not a reason to do that. So for GPU, you take the, the equation that we've set up for you is 
you take two times 128 divided by the number of tasks you want per node. And for a GPU, it's two times 64 divided by the tasks per node. And for example, here, if you have five MPA tasks that you want to run per GPU node, the little c needs to be set to 24. You have two times 64 divided by five, and you hit that is, is not obviously 12 exactly, but that's where you want to round to, and you get 24. If it's for a CPU node, it's 50. And I'll just let you figure that out in your own exercise if you'd like. And again, there's so many more best practices that you can follow. And not only from our documentation, but from our migrating from Cori to Perlmutter training, they have a lot of really good uh, slides that I went through and put some information from just kind of to get in here. So I wanted to link to those as well. And that's it for the best practices. So I'm going to go straight into uh, debugging tools here. Um, this is mainly kind of a presentation about the availability of debugging tools. It's not going to tell you how to do debugging. That's a very ex extended process. Um, but this kind of gives you an inventory of what's available. And so you can give some ideas about, okay, what's my problem and what tools should I take a look at? Um, if you want to look at your program in a graphical G, uh, GUI um, debugger, you know, you want to see, you know, maybe there's a deadlock or you want to see where your nodes are communicating. Um, DDT and Total View are full-fledged GUI debuggers, and those are the best options for that. Um, there's a Compute Sanitizer and a Secuda GDB if you're using um, GPU-type style things. Um, they're non-MPI CUDA debuggers, and they're provided by NVIDIA. Um, you can use GDB using GDB for HPC. It's text-based. It's provided by Cray, and it it works very well. It's a, a very interesting way of debugging. So it's not for everybody, um, but it is there and it's available if you're familiar with GDB. And for finding memory related bugs, we have two tools, again, provided by Cray. Valgrind and Sanitizer is both for HPC. And the for HPC part is basically Cray took Valgrind, added some ways to launch it with SRUN in a parallel uh, manner using MPI and then applied the regular tool to it. If you have a debug, if you're trying to debug a crash or a deadlock, there's STAT and ATP. STAT is Static Trace Analysis Toolkit and ATP is Abnormal uh, Termination Processing. And again, all of these tools are listed and uh, documented on our debug uh, webpage. Um, before you start debugging, make sure you set up a remote desktop connection you need to compile your program, set up your environment, and allocate your compute resources. Just kind of your basic stuff that you'd want to do anyway, but you want to make sure you set it up correct because there's a lot of setup for debugging. Um, a remote desktop connection usually is best with NX or no machine. Um, it's faster than traditional X11 forwarding over SSH, and both DDT and TotalView have their own client you can install on your system, but sometimes it's not an option. Um, and so you can use it this way as well. When you're compiling your program to do debugging, which is something that you have to specifically do in a lot of cases, um, you need to make sure that you use the dash G flag um, so that it includes debugging symbols. And then you want to use dash capital O zero, that's dash capital O zero for zero optimizations. When you're setting up your environment, you want to make sure that you set the U limit for core files to be unlimited so that you can dump core and use that with, say, GDB to take a look. There's some environment variables that are important here for both MPitch and CUDA. And if you're using the HPE tools, they have something called the common tools interface that they use for these HPC for, or these like GDB for HPC uh, type tools. And it has a, uh, uh, environment variable um, that you can set to uh, no CU slurm 
as the job launcher. And then for allocating nodes, we kind of went over this already, but um, make sure you're using either interactive or debug for the queue and make sure you're setting your constraint for your CPU and GPU. Um, for DDT, which is the most popular of the ones that we uh, have available, it supports MPI, OpenMP, OpenACC, CUDA, and Python. It's developed by Lenaro, though it's been developed by about 10 other people before them. Um, it's been around for a very long time. Um, right now, you just kind of module load Forge and then just DDT the program. Uh, it's very easy to get started with. Um, here's kind of some of the uh, screenshots of how to use it. I won't go into any depth on these. Uh, these are mainly for reference. Again, notice it says ARM and ARM Forge in the top. That's because Lenaro just basically got this adopted to them from ARM less than a month ago. Uh, this is how the job launcher works. This is kind of the basic view as everything is coming into place. Here you see in the bottom, you can kind of get a look at what the stack looks like. And then for navigation, you have the things up top that allow you to move throughout the stack, in and out of blocks, stuff like that. You can evaluate expressions and check variables in the bottom right. And you can do things like spark lines and stacks and locals on the right upper. Again, this is just kind of more uh, views of things that are available within the uh, tool itself. Uh, total view is another one. This again supports all the same uh, kind of programming stuff. It's been developed by many different companies throughout the years. Right now it's developed by Perforce. Um, it has a remote client, which can you can use to set up remote connections if you don't want to use SSH and you're able to install the client yourself. Again, you will module load total view and then S run your debug application. There's a lot more information again on total view in the man page in our documentation. And in fact, we've had a training event just on using total view uh, last year. And so the, the link there kind of gives you a lot more information. Again, here's kind of just the initial look of how everything is after you load the program. Um, you got some navigation, you have some GPU focus on different things. You have the show, uh, the state of MPI tasks and the threads within them. You have breakpoints, you have other things that you can do to evaluate uh, values. Okay, on to CUDA. So debugging CUDA params with CUDA GDB, and this is again, CUDA only. Uh, there's a CUDA GDB tool uh, developed again by NVIDIA. And you basically just run your program with your core file and it works just like it would with GDB, except that it has an extra uh, set of commands that you can get by running help CUDA. And I've included further documentation um, there as well. Uh, the compute sanitizers, aka CUDA memcheck, these are provided by um, LLVM initially, um, but they give you a bunch of different ways to detect conditions that are happening in your code. Um, and these all happen at runtime. Uh, you can do your S run compute sanitizer with your tool, uh, memcheck, for example, to get memory errors. It finds race conditions, it finds un un uh, uninitialized variables, and it can do some sync error checking. Again, these compute sanitizers basically run the like sanitizer. It runs your program, and then it looks for these different types of checks. Uh, this is the GDB for HPC. Um, it's, again, extensions to GDB put together by HPE Cray. It does not support GDPUs, but it allows you to launch your MPI program um, in a uh, using a special syntax, using view sets and launch command. I put together some more documentation on that. But the GDB for HPC man page is actually very complete when it comes to using this tool. Um, this is kind of an example of launching the application, uh, seeing where uh, all of the uh, nodes are within the uh, source code and printing out something called the view set, which is the collection of all the processes. So for example, if you had a set of processes that 
sent data versus a, a set of processes that were receiving data. You could have multiple view sets, one that sends, one that receives, and you could name them however you wish. And this would allow you to do different operations on a different set of uh, processes. You can print a specific uh, rank um, for your processes. Um, you can list and see where they all are. You can set breakpoints. Okay, Valgrind for HPC. Again, this is based on Valgrind. It's an uh, addition from what HPE uh, Cray put in. Um, and it aggregates a lot of results from MPI ranks. And it has improved messaging over what Valgrind would normally have. This acts like the sanitizers that NVIDIA put out. It allows you to do things like check for memory errors, check for unelectronized variables, and stuff like that. Um, again, there's uh, some good uh, coverage in both the man pages and on our docs as well. Uh, sanitizers for HPC, this is something similar again to what was NVIDIA put out, but these ones are from HPE Cray and they're, excuse me, based on the LLVM sanitizers. Um, there's some GitHub links to take a look at them. Again, you just kind of launch them with some options and it'll take a look at all the different ways that you can check memory, check for initialized variables, things like that. Stack trace analysis toolkit. Um, this can either launch a job or you can attach to a job that's hung using a process ID and you can print out the stack trace of what's going on. So if you see that 99% of your MPI ranks are in one spot, and then 1% of your MPI ranks are doing something else, then maybe that 1% is what you should look at to see where the lock might be happening. And you could use this by doing a module load on CrayStat, uh, srun with your program, get the PID, attach with stat, stat will output the data. You can use stat view to view the results. Here's just kind of an example of doing that with stat. Here's an example of what it could look like if you're doing something here. Okay, and now you have abnormal termination processing. This is for jobs that are just crashing and you don't know why they're crashing. So it has a signal handler that processes termination signals and gathers and merges all of the stack traces for all of the processes and then selectively produces a set of core files. It doesn't produce a core file per MPI rank. It will produce a, uh, a core file that matches a set of MPI ranks. So you won't get, if you have 20 ranks, you're gonna get 20 core files. You would get one if they were all the same or you would get two if there was one kind of outlier, for example. Um, it supports MPI threads and CUDA. Uh, you can use it with stat. When you use it, you specifically need to load the module and set the ATP enabled equals one. Otherwise, you will not be able to uh, get the backtracing work, uh, backtraces to work. And this is because it does a lot of stuff in the background and they want to make sure that you specifically want to use this. Um, there are some here options here, for example, to use the GDB binary instead of what ATP has built in for looking at the stack traces. Sometimes that's better. Um, for GNU Fortran, you have to actually set the F no backtrace in the application. And again, you just S run your program. It's going to crash after it's crashed before it exits. It runs this ATP program that outputs all of the data. You use stat to view the data, and then you figure out what happened from there. Um, this is an example of a stat of what gets dumped um, by ATP. All right. And I'm going to move straight on into performance tools. There's a lot of performance tools, again, similar to, uh, to debugging tools available. Um, they all do kind of the same thing, show 
show things the same things, but they all do it in kind of different ways. And they all have different uh, support for the different types of languages and programming models that you might use. Cray has several different tools under the naming of Craypat. Um, they have Craypat Lite, they have a reveal, they have Apprentice 2. Um, that works on everything um, on a Cray system, except for Python. NVIDIA's Insight systems, which we're also going to review, are mainly for GPUs, and it works with the NVIDIA uh, set of tools. So you need to be using either Python or uh, the programming environment for NVIDIA. And again, there's a lot more. They're all kind of listed on the website on docs.nurse.gov. Um, CrayPad is specifically for use on Cray machines, as I said. That's because it interacts with the Cray compiler and some of the other compilers to do a lot of fancy stuff. What it does is it takes your program after you've built it and it adds different hooks into it so that when it runs, it can record some data. And this is why you need to load the modules before you uh, compile your code. And if you wanna use it, it does require at least relinking your code rather than recompiling. Perf tools base is almost always loaded by default, and this is required if you want to use perf tools, because that's where all the hooks are involved. Um, and then there's a perf tools module for the full suite of applications, and a light module for just basic analysis. Um, if you wanted to do, say uh, work with the Jacoby solver here, um, you're going to want to run under Scratch. You want to make sure your object files are separate and that they're present. Um, to visualize again, you can use Apprentice 2. I've talked about kind of the X forwarding and X stuff in previous, on uh, the debugging talk. Um, and then here's some steps, for example, to get this application uh, running with Perf Tools Lite. And once Perf Tools Lite gets done, uh, or once the application gets done running, this is what comes out from Perf Tools Lite at the end. It tells you kind of a basic information about your job, how the job was run, the uh, nodes that it was on, and it gives you some basic IO and processing time, some memory usage. And then it gives you kind of a breakdown of the functions within your uh, program this user section and capital user are user defined functions. When it says loop, that's referring to a loop in specific at line 61, but within the function Jacobi MPI open MP. And you can see here that um, the majority of the samples taken were actually inside of those two loops. Etsy uh, is a group that is for functions in the Cray system that are special and sometimes can be found um, from internal compilers or things like that, that you don't necessarily write, but are there. And then the MPI are the MPI functions, or sometimes if you're using other things, it can be other communication functions. Again, you have some more of the same things, but this is a profile uh, by group, and it allows you to look at where more of the line numbers are uh, leading to things. Let's see. Kind of the same. Uh, this table is uh, for exclusive time rather than uh, regular time. Am I missing something? Is it looping? Sorry, I guess it was looping there. I'm not sure why. You want to use the full set for pet build, you have uh, the option to use the APA experiment. This stands for automated profiling analysis. And this is reviewed by uh, a Perf Tools again demo that was given by Paul Levesque in September 2022. He helped design a lot of these pet tools, so he has a very deep understanding of perf tools so that's a good presentation to look at if you're interested in this and then once you do your pat build of your apa you can also 
Alternatively, to use something called dash u, which will trace user functions, or g, which will trace some of your MPI functions. Uh, once you have everything out, you get this kind of XF files and a data dir. These are just these are binary files that are optimized for writing to, but they're not. But they're huge, and there's a lot of them. So what you can do is you convert this to an AP2 file, which is essentially just an SQLite database, and then you can move that file around. Or you can use that with some of the other tooling, such as Apprentice 2. And this is kind of a view of what Apprentice 2 shows on the left. It gives you kind of the basic splash view of what is going on with your application. You can see in the bottom left that there's a load imbalance, and that's what that I stands for. On the right here, you can see where most of the samples were taken. Um, you can see that main contains most of the samples. Uh, here on the right, you can see the uh, call tree for everything, where all the samples are taken and where all the time is being done. Uh, here we have the activity in the PEs. Here we have the communication matrix or what they call the mosaic. This lets you know where all of your PE communication is taking place. Light green is good, red is but worse. You can look at the bottom there for a scale. And then we have the uh, insight systems that are provided by NVIDIA. Uh, they have a low overhead uh, profiler. Um, it mainly, like I said, it supports CUDA. Um, and it uses Cocos, OpenMP, and OpenACC as well. If you want to use these, you need to make sure you do an S run to get the profile. And then once that comes back out, you'll get some basic statistics about the time, the calls, and the averages within each function. You get some more statistics for things that might be mangled. Um, you can do unmangling. Uh, CratePad does that by default. But you can do unmangling with the compiler if you need to know more about what's going on. You have memory operations by time and by size. And then you have some visualization that NVIDIA Insight can give you into what's going on. This is a over time view, timeline view. It has a baseline and your ability to uh, find ways to exploit against it. You want to use that, make sure that you're, again, loading the modules and that you're using the profile. And this gives you the visualization results and gives you an idea about the utilization that you're using, what could be used, and some of the rules and the baselines that you can apply for throughput. And here's an example of something that was improved um, due to some loop using. All right. 